Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ada, and I will be your conference operator for this session. Welcome to Grab's second quarter 2024 earnings results call. After speakers' remarks, there will be a questions and answer session. I will now turn it over to Douglas Yu to start the call. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Grab's second quarter 2024 earnings call. I'm Douglas Yu, Director of Investor Relations and Strategic Finance at Grab. And joining me today are Anthony Tan, Chief Executive Officer, Alex Hungate, Chief Operating Officer, and Peter Oe, Chief Financial Officer. During the call today, Anthony will discuss our key strategic and business achievements, followed by Alex, who will provide operational highlights, and Peter will share details of our second quarter 2024 financial results. Following the prepared remarks, we will open the call to questions. During this call, we will be making forward-looking statements about future events, including our future business and financial performance. These statements are based on our current beliefs and expectations. Actual results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties as described on this earnings call, in the earnings release, and in our Form 20F, and other filings with the SEC. We do not undertake any duty to update any forward-looking statements. We will also be discussing non-IFRS financial measures on this call. These measures supplement but do not replace IFRS financial measures. Please refer to the earnings materials for a reconciliation of non-IFRS to IFRS financial measures. For more information, please refer to our earnings press release and supplemental presentation available on our IR website. And with that, I will turn the call over to Anthony to deliver his remarks. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for joining us today. During the quarter, we focused on leveraging our platform scale to drive profitable growth. On-demand GMV, group monthly transacting users, and group revenues hit new all-time highs. While our on-demand transactions actually grew strongly at 22% year-on-year, we also delivered our 10th consecutive quarter of group-adjusted EBITDA improvement, even as we invested into new products and faced foreign currency headwinds. This underscores our relentless focus on generating sustainable and profitable growth at scale in the long term. And as we balance growth and cost discipline, we achieved our second quarter of positive adjusted free cash flow, giving us the confidence for adjusted free cash flow to turn positive for the full year of 2024. As a company, we're committed to deliver the best value and service quality for our platform users and partners. Our strategy to be product and tech-led has been key to unlocking platform growth. During the quarter, we rolled out more affordable and high-value offerings across mobility and deliveries to meet the diverse needs of our users. We also focus on providing more tailored solutions to our users. For example, family accounts, advanced booking, group orders, and dine-out deals are nascent products today, but have begun to gain strong traction and bring greater convenience for our users. At the same time, Grab Unlimited, our subscriptions program, hit a new all-time high in total subscribers in the quarter. On the banks, we had a public launch of Superbank in June, our digital bank in Indonesia. And with all the three digital banks now fully operational, together with GrabFin, our fintech platform, we are very excited about our opportunities to continue driving financial inclusion across the region. Our DG Bank deposits, lending dispersals, and total customers across GrabFin and our DG Banks continue to demonstrate robust growth, reflecting the trust our users have placed in us. Deposits in GXS Bank in Singapore and GX Bank in Malaysia grew substantially by over 50% quarter on quarter to $730 million, with total loan dispersals across GrabFin and our DG Banks hitting an annualized run rate of $2 billion in the second quarter. The strong growth across our financial services platform is underpinned by the ability to leverage the scale of the Grab ecosystem. For our DG Bank in Malaysia, for instance, approximately one in two GX Bank users transact on Grab with their GX Bank account. And in less than a year since its public launch, GX Bank has over 750,000 deposit customers which include more than 500,000 GX Bank debit card holders as of July 2024. Super Bank also crossed 1 million deposit customers in August in less than two months following its public launch in June. As we look towards the second half of 2024 and beyond, 
we will embrace a three-pronged approach to continue outserving our users and ecosystem partners across the region. First, we will continue dedicating our efforts to scaling our ecosystem. We are bullish on the long-term growth outlook of Southeast Asia, with economists forecasting mid-term GDP growth rates in the region to be faster than the world average. And against a backdrop of stronger inbound tourism flows and strengthening domestic demand. To capture this growth, we will leverage all of our assets to our advantage, be it improving the selection of affordable or high-value offerings on our on-demand platform and driving cross-sell opportunities across our various services. Second, and as we have sh actually shared previously, we will continue to be AI-led in driving platform and profitable growth. By doing so, we will solve the most impactful everyday problems in Southeast Asia in the fastest way possible to deliver value creation for our shareholders and generate sustainable free cash flow. At the same time, we are continuing our investment into generative AI to drive efficiency gains across our business and deliver innovative customer and partner experiences. For example, we have rolled out AI-powered dish descriptions in five out of eight markets at scale. Our experiments have shown a significant improvement in checkout rates from our long-tail merchant partners that used AI-generated descriptions. This is but one of many examples of the way we are leveraging foundational AI capabilities and generative AI to continue to improve our marketplace. And finally, we'll continue to drive cost discipline across our business. Regional corporate costs in the second quarter declined 14% year-on-year. So our intention here is clear. By striving to build a lean and agile organization, we will be in pole position to outserve not only our ecosystem and users, but also improve shareholder returns by continuing to generate profitable growth and sustainable free cash flow. Before I pass the time over to Alex, I'm also pleased to announce that we published our latest ESG report demonstrating our steadfast commitment to delivering a triple bottom line business. We firmly believe the long-term success of our business is intricately linked to the welfare of the communities we serve and the health of our planet. And in this regard, my heart goes out to all those who are affected by Typhoon Gemi and other adverse weather events across the region. Grab's commitment during challenging times like this is to respond quickly in any way we can to help governments, our driver and merchant partners, as well as our users, and to play our part in supporting recovery post-calamity. For our communities in the Philippines, they were particularly hard hit by a typhoon. We activated our community assistance program to provide support to our partners affected by the severe weather. Additionally, we utilized grab maps and real-time reports from our fleets to help our partners navigate safely through affected areas. Now, as GEMI has moved on, we're partnering organizations like Jollibee Food Group and McDonald's and Red Cross for our users to donate their grab rewards points towards recovery efforts. From our hearts, we are grateful for all these partners who came together quickly to serve our communities during and post a calamity. I'll now hand over the time over to Alex, who will cover our second quarter operational highlights in more detail. Thanks, Anthony. Over the next few minutes, I will share our operational highlights and the underlying drivers of these results, starting with deliveries. We generated strong deliveries growth in the quarter by improving the affordability and reliability of our services with some significant tech and product initiatives, along with strong growth from Jaya. On a year-on-year -year basis, deliveries GMV grew 14% on a constant currency basis as we drove food transactions growth by 11% year-on-year. Segment-adjusted EBITDA margins remain stable even as we invested in these new product rollouts. Saver deliveries gained further traction, reaching 28% of deliveries transactions from around 10% a year ago, creating meaningful uplifts for our ecosystem, with Saver users exhibiting average order frequency levels 1.9 times higher than non-Saver users. Saver also attracted new users to Grab, with 15% of new deliveries monthly transacting users joining the platform through Saver Delivery. On currently, at the high end of the pricing ladder, we grew adoption of priority deliveries to 7% of deliveries transactions. We see a lot more potential in this relatively 
horizon sensitive segment. We particularly focus on innovating new ways to support large so social gatherings and return to the office. For example, we revamped and relaunched group orders. So we've seen group orders driving basket sizes that were two times higher than average grab food orders. And by enabling our users to connect seamlessly with each other on the platform, we're able to amplify new user growth and leverage our scale to drive improvements in retention, basket sizes, and batching rates. This allows us to pass on cost savings to users in the form of lower delivery fees, which in turn accelerates growth. We strive to be the partner of choice for Southeast Asia's most loved merchants. We've increased median, urgent, uh, median earnings for our deliveries merchant partners by 15% year on year by making our powerful self-serve advertising platform available to merchants of all sizes. The total number of monthly active advertisers who joined our self-serve platform increased 56% year on year to 168,000, while average spend by monthly active advertisers on our self-serve platform increased by 26% year on year. Revenue generated from our advertising business as a percentage of deliveries GMV was 1.5% in the second quarter, recovering back to fourth quarter 2023 penetration levels despite the latter typically being the seasonally strongest quarter for advertising. From here, we see plenty of headroom for advertising penetration to grow further. Looking ahead to the rest of the year, we will continue to build our position as the leading on-demand platform in the region. And while the third quarter is typically impacted by adverse weather conditions in Southeast Asia, for example, Typhoon Gami in the Philippines that Anthony just mentioned, we see demand levels in July remaining robust nonetheless. And as such, as such, we expect that to drive sequential growth for our deliveries segment, heading both into the third quarter and the fourth quarter of this year. Moving on to mobility now, new product rollouts and deepening adoption of our existing affordability and high value offerings powered mobility GMV to 25% year on year growth on a constant currency basis. Similar to the delivery segment, this strong GMV growth was led by increased transaction volumes, which grew 38% year on year, while mobility NTUs also expanded by 26%. One of the new products that is driving this transaction and MTU growth is Saver ride hailing, which is now available in five markets. Saver offers more affordable options alongside our established grab car or grab bike products. And while these products may involve some trade-offs for passengers in the quality of the vehicles or the longer waiting times, they have enabled us to expand our addressable market, all while upholding our core value propositions of safety and reliability. Adoption of safety transport rides has increased to around a quarter of mobility transactions in the second quarter from 15% in the same period last year with 14% of group MTUs joining the Grab platform transacting on a Saver mobility offering. Saver transport rides also drive loyalty and engagement uplifts. 8% of MTUs who joined the Grab platform through Saver transport rides were cross-sold to food in the same month. And in Indonesia, for example, users of our Saver ride hailing model recorded frequency levels which were 1.9 times higher than non-Saver users. Similarly, Move It, our two-wheel offering in the Philippines that was relaunched last year, continues to display strong momentum. Today, Move It users comprise almost a third of mobility MTUs in the Philippines, underpinning, underpinning the strong growth of mobility MTUs in the Philippines, which grew 92% year on year. We balance this growth of affordable ride-hailing solutions with high-value differentiated services that further maximize convenience and reliability for the less price sensitive users. Our high value offerings such as Grab Premium generated revenues per ride that were over two times higher than standard rides. One of such higher value products is the advanced booking ride hail product, which was relaunched earlier this year as a product where passengers have no doubt that the driver will be there waiting for them. This enabled us to drive over three times higher driver earnings per ride compared to our conventional mobility products. Similarly, we have focused on growing adoption of our premium end offerings to travelers and corporate users, which today comprise a smaller proportion of mobility volumes. 
The net effect of new product launches and changing product mix, such as the growth of Saver Rides and the expansion of Move It, did result in segment-adjusted EBITDA margins for mobility declining in the second quarter. This was in line with our expectations as we made a strategic decision in the quarter to prudently invest it to deepen market penetration and drive growth for the longer term. We remain committed to achieving our long-term segment-adjusted EBITDA margin guidance of 9% plus for mobility. Finally, in line with our mission, we also continue to improve productivity of drivers on our platform. During the quarter, we increased active driver supply while optimizing our existing driver supply to meet the strong demand growth. In the second quarter of 2024, monthly active driver supply increased by 13% on year on year and 5% quarter on quarter, while quarterly active driver retention rates remained healthy at 90%. Our efforts to improve driver supply and efficiency resulted in an 11% percentage point reduction in the proportion of surge, surge mobility rides year on year. Mobility fulfillment rates also improved sequentially given the strong demand levels and increased driver supply. We are confident on the long-term trajectory of our mobility business and see ample room for volumes and user penetration to grow as we continue to roll out new products and services. Going into the third quarter, Mobility continues to pace strongly in spite of the adverse weather conditions, and we expect to drive sequential growth in the coming quarters. Now, finally, our financial services segment. This segment continues to grow fast, with revenues growing 61% year-on-year on a constant currency basis, while segment-adjusted EBITDA losses narrowed by 44% year-on-year. We continue to scale up our lending business to serve ecosystem partners and users, where we have a strong underwriting, customer acquisition, and collective advantage in relation to traditional banks and other fintech and digibank peers. Total loans dispersed in the second quarter grew 43% year-on-year to reach $500 million, or an annualized run rate of $2 billion. And we ended the quarter with a loan portfolio of $397 million, underpinned by the continued growth of ecosystem lending in GrabFin and growing flexi-loan volumes from GXS Bank in Singapore. And remember, we have yet to launch our lending products in GX Bank uh, in Malaysia. We continue to maintain a prudent stance on credit risk with 90-day non-performing loans stable at around 2%. And we're generating healthy risk-adjusted returns on our loan portfolio, even after accounting for allowances for credit losses. Customer deposits across GX Bank and, G and GXS expanded to, two, to $730 million at the end of the second quarter, rising by 52% from $479 million in the prior quarter. The strong growth was driven by an increased number of deposit customers for GX Bank in Malaysia, as the bank continues to acquire more users from the Grab platform. In less than a year since its public launch, GX Bank has over 750,000 deposit customers, which include more than 500,000 GX Bank uh, debit card holders as of July 2024. We have also serviced more customers in GXS Bank in Singapore as regulatory caps on deposits were raised again. Overall, then, our financial services business continues to be a strong driver of ecosystem growth and cross-sell opportunities. As an example, I spoke earlier about the growth of our two-wheel offerings in the Philippines. So the expansion of MoveIt has resulted in nearly a two times increase in our active driver supply pool year on year. So that enables us to drive cross-sell opportunities to other Grab services such as lending, which saw Philippines driver cash advances hitting a new monthly record high in June. Concurrently, driver partners and merchant partners with active loans recorded higher transit hours and higher retention. Regionally, merchant partners with an active loan exhibit six-month retention rates that are 1.4 times higher than merchants without a loan. And driver partners with an active loan exhibited almost two times higher average earnings as compared to drivers um, without a loan. Going forward, our financial services business continues to be fast-growing, and we see significant opportunities for further growth ahead across both our GrabFin and Digibank businesses. And in closing, we'll continue to scale our platform by leveraging product, tech-driven initiatives to maximize 
marketplace efficiencies, reliability, and convenience, enabling Grab to drive greater cost efficiencies across our business. We are dedicated to capitalizing on our scale advantage and our leadership in the mobility and food delivery sectors to create value for all stakeholders, particularly the 41 million monthly transacting users currently on our platform. With that, let me turn the call over to Peter. Thanks, Alex. Before going to our results, it's important to highlight that Southeast Asia saw foreign exchange translational impacts that led to a divergence between our headline and constant currency growth rates. As the Southeast Asian currencies weaken against the US dollar year on year, this translated to an impact of 528 basis points on the year on year on demand GMB growth rates and 549 basis points on revenue growth rates. Now, withstanding these FX headwinds, our underlying demand in the region remains strong, as seen in the positive year on year GDP growth across Southeast Asia in the first half of 2024. This is driven by strong domestic demand and continued tourism recovery in the region. Now, turning to our Q2 financial results, now let me start with revenues. Group revenues in the second quarter grew 17% year on year, or 23% on a constant currency basis to reach an all time high of $664 million. On a year on year basis, mobility revenue was up 19% or 23% on a constant currency basis as we recorded strong growth in mobility MTU and transactions. Our deliveries revenue grew 11% or 17% on a constant currency basis. Deliveries MTUs continue to grow as we drove top line growth in food deliveries, advertising, and Jaya Grocer. Incentive spend as a proportion of deliveries GMV was down 40 basis points year on year. And financial services revenue was up 54% or 61% on a constant currency basis, driven growth by mainly from lending across Grabfin and GXS Bank, and further optimization of payments incentive spend. Moving on to on-demand GMV, year-on-year -year, second quarter on-demand GMV grew 13% or 18% on a constant currency basis to $4.4 billion. On a segment level and year-on-year -year basis, mobility GMV continues to grow strongly at 20% or 25% on a constant currency basis and deliveries GMV growing by 9% or 14% on a constant currency basis to $2.9 billion. Segment adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was $148 million, which grew by 84% year on year from the same period last year. Mobility segment adjusted EBITDA grew 14% year on year to $129 million. Mobility segment adjusted EBITDA margins were 8.2% in the second quarter of 2024 and declined from 8.6% in the same period last year. Now, this is mainly driven by product mix and also consistent with our efforts to invest in rolling out new products and services. Delivery segment adjusted EBITDA grew over four times to reach $42 million dollars while delivery segment adjusted EBITDA margins on GMV expanded by 110 basis points year on year to 1.5%, driven by lower overhead expenses, greater optimization of our incentive spend as a percentage of deliveries GMV, and also increased contributions from advertising. Our financial services segment adjusted EBITDA losses narrowed by 44% year on year to negative $24 million. The reduction in losses were attributed to the improved monetization of our lending products that drove higher revenues and reductions also in overhead expenses. Overall, we remain committed to achieve our long-term segment adjusted EBITDA margin guidance of 9% plus for mobility and 4% plus for deliveries, and for the banks to break even by no later than the end of 2026 while at the same time also investing in new growth initiatives strategically across the business. On regional copper costs for the quarter came at $84 million, 
compared to $98 million in the same period in 2023 and $91 million in the prior quarter. We focused on driving cost efficiencies across our organization, with regional copper costs declining 14% year-on-year, coming from both fixed and variable cost components. Our commitment towards driving both top and bottom line improvements is demonstrated by our 10th quarter of sequential group adjusted EBITDA growth. Group adjusted EBITDA was $64 million for the quarter, an improvement of, of, an improvement of $81 million from the same period last year. On net cash from operating activities, we recorded a positive $272 million cash inflow for the quarter, an improvement of, two, of $323 million year on year. This was attributed to reduction in losses before income tax combined with positive momentum in customer deposits for our banks. Adjusted free cash flow was $36 million in the second quarter and negative $67 million on a trailing 12 months basis. On a year on year basis, this represents an improvement of $56 million following increased profitability and a reduction in CAPEX. As for our second quarter operating loss, on a year-on-year -year basis, it improved by $121 million to negative $56 million, attributable mainly to increase in revenue and lower restructuring expenses. IFRS net loss for the quarter improved by $79 million to negative $68 million, largely driven by improvement in our operating losses, offset by increases in income tax expense and net foreign exchange loss of $53 million year on year. The IFRS loss of $68 million is inclusive of $153 million of non-cash expenses below the adjusted EBITDA line of this $82 million was from share-based compensation expenses. Moving on to our balance sheet and liquidity position. Gross cash liquidity stood at $5.6 billion at the end of the second quarter, which is an improvement of $267 million as compared to the prior quarter, with a substantial part of the cash inflow attributed to the growth in deposits from customers in GXS Bank and GX Bank, which increased to $730 million from $479 million from the prior quarter. Net cash liquidity similarly increased to $5.3 billion at the end of the second quarter compared to $5 billion at the end of the prior quarter. As to our authorized $500 million share repurchase program, we repurchased an additional 9.6 million shares in the aggregate principal amount of $34.6 million over the second quarter. Cumulatively, we have repurchased and retired 40 million shares in the aggregate principal amount of $131 million. As we look ahead to the second half of 2024, we expect to drive sequential on-demand GMV and group adjusted EBITDA growth. We will continue to innovate and expand our product offerings across our platform to serve new users while improving the loyalty and engagement among our existing users. We expect revenue growth to accelerate beyond 2024 as such initiatives, along with the new contributions from the banks and advertising, both ramping up as they scale. On our guidance for 2024, we are maintaining our full year 2024 revenue guidance of $2.7 to $2.75 billion and an adjusted EBITDA guidance of $250 to $270 million. And we expect to land at the upper end of our EBITDA guidance range. I also want to call out that our revenue growth outlook of 14 to 17% year on year assumes roughly 3.5 percentage point currency headwind, the total reported year on year growth. On overhead costs, we will continue to maintain discipline in managing our cost base. And then we expect regional copper costs to improve year on year. Improving from our prior expectations for regional copper costs to remain stable. 
As for the full year adjusted free cash flow, we remain committed to driving substantial improvement year on year and now expect to achieve positive adjusted free cash flow for the full year 2024. To conclude, we remain committed to growing our business sustainably and good on generating profitable growth and free cash flow while delivering top line growth. It is also important for us to continue strategic investments on our product offerings and innovate in order to ensure our competitiveness and deliver value to our stakeholders in the long term. As always, Anthony, Alex and I would like to express gratitude to our partners, our users, our shareholders and to our grabbers for your continued trust and partnership. Thanks very much for your time and now we'll open up the call to questions. Operator. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now start the questions and answers portion of the call. Please press star 1 to ask question, and we will call on you for your question. When asking questions, please limit it to two questions per person. Your first question comes from the line of Panvit at Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Also, congratulations on a solid quarter. I know that, that your second quarter GMV and revenue were hamper as a result of the FX weakness against the US dollar. If not for that, growth actually look uh, quite strong in the uh, second quarter. Could you also share some color on what you are seeing in the second half of the year in terms of these macro competitive and also on the industry? Industry perspective, are you actually seeing improving sign in your market, which gives you the confidence to meet the upper end of your guidance items, or even there's some room for you to potentially even beat on the guidance still? That's question number one. Question number two on mobility, can you uh, explain and provide more color on the dip in EBITDA margin quarter on quarter? What is the reason behind this? And also, uh, could you also provide some color on how this these margins will trend in the coming quarters. Thank you. Thanks, Pan. Great questions. Uh, let me start, then I'll hand to Peter to just confirm the guidance. So, yeah, you're right. The US dollar strengthening did have a big impact on the headline growth in the, in the second quarter. Um, the good news is that so far this quarter, as you know, US dollar has weakened, I think, around 4% quarter to date. So those headwinds from the second quarter are kind of turning into tailwinds for us here um, in the third quarter. The macro outlook looks strong in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So foreign direct inflows and economies um, are at strong, robust levels. Singapore recently upgraded its GDP forecast as well for the full year 2024. And on the ground, we're seeing tourism continuing to grow particularly, uh, you know, European visitors and then Indian visitors as, as well, although China is still uh, behind where it was pre-COVID. Uh, and then your question on competition, I guess our markets have always been competitive, so there's no change there. We continue to main our category, maintain our category leadership, uh, both in the region and in every market. So our strategy is quite simple. We use this scale advantage along with our consistent investment in product and tech to drive improvements in both reliability and affordability while growing profitability at the same time, as you've seen from our 10th uh, quarter of improving profitability that seems to be uh, gaining traction um, at the same time as we're growing CP. Uh, features like mapping, hyperbatching, and just-in-time allocation, they're all unique to Grab, so none of our competitors have that. And we believe that makes us consistently more reliable as well as more affordable, um, as well as uh, obviously attracting consumers because of the reliability with the group MTUs now at an all-time high. So it's very difficult for any local competitors in, our, in any of our markets to replicate that strategy because they simply don't have that scale and the technology to show sustainable profitability in the same way as we are. The trading update is positive. I hope that came across in comments um, in the prepared remarks. So demand for both deliveries and mobility has been strong in the first half of this quarter, despite those difficult typhoon conditions that we referred to in several countries. 
So we do expect to drive sequential GMV growth for both deliveries and mobility, as well as uh, group adjusted EBITDA growth. And Peter, you want to talk about the guidance? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, if, Bang, if you, if you heard Alex there, we are at the sequential GMV growth, both deliveries and mobility, uh, as well as also in the financial services front. We're picking up traction there on our lending book. Uh, the banks are starting to scale. We're confident that the, on, on the EBITDA side, we'll land at the upper end, uh, which implies that our second half will be stronger than the first half. And that's not, let's not also forget that the free cash flow generating in the business is now in momentum. Uh, we expect that just a free cash flow positive for the full year. So all these estimates are already baked in in the, all the competitive elements and the product investments plans that we make throughout the year. So we're feeling pretty good at how the second half will shape, will shape up for us uh, with a lot of these investments that we made in the first quarter and the second quarter translating into the second half. Thanks, Peter. And then, Pang, your second question was on mobility margins, you know, the dip in, the, in this particular quarter and reasons behind this uh, and trends in the next coming quarters. Well, our main observation on mobility is that there's a long runway for growth for mobility in Southeast Asia. So we're just literally scratching the surface, we believe. So we want to, we want to target with, with, with more affordability along with reliability, we want to target a growth of the TAM basically by continuing to attract new users. So we have been rolling out those innovative affordable new products they are unlocking new users, so the strategy is working. So in the quarter, mobility GMV grew 25% uh, you know, year on year on that constant currency basis, so lim similar to the delivery segment. Um, and then, then that growth was led by transaction volumes, which is what you'd expect, obviously, with an affordability strategy. Um, so the transaction volumes grew even faster at 38% year on year. And then the MTU is growing at 26% year on year. So the strategy is working. It's exactly what we had planned. Um, so the net effect did lead to a, a reduction in segment adjusted EBITDA margins in the second quarter, but uh, very much in line with our expectations. And we, but we expect that the EBITDA to improve sequentially from here, um, third quarter and fourth quarter. And we remain committed to our long-term margin expectations of 9% plus for mobility. Operator, next question. The second question comes from the line of Alicia Yap at Citigroup. Uh, hi, good evening, management. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, two questions. First is, um, wanted to get management comment um, how are we perceive these potential disruptions of the on-demand service given the entrance and partnership of the short video platform with uh, other on-demand peers. Um, how will Grab plan to defend uh, the threat and how will that impact the EBITDA margin if we need to fight back uh, with more subsidy? Um, second is that if we can get uh, some updates on, I know you roll out some products offering like the corporate, the premium cars, um, and also uh, those airport pickups, um, any program on that and also any update on the Transcap acquisition. Thank you. Okay, thanks Alicia for those three questions. Uh, first one, yeah, we do work with all the major social media partners ourselves as well. We use it to drive top of funnel user acquisition and to reduce our CAC. So there's a lot of optimization that we do as we, as we go from one to the next to, to drive top of funnel. Uh, but we are confident that consumers w do prefer Grab's in-app experience further down the funnel because, of course, that reliability and affordability that we offer due to our scale. And there's deep functionality in the Grab app, as you're aware, with the ability, for example, for the, for the uh, user to communicate with driver and merchant directly throughout. Uh, you know, and those product advantages like the largest driver partner network in the region, we use Grab Maps across all the markets. About 90% of the, dri the, the, the drivers would use Grab Maps to, to navigate. Uh, and then, of course, the super app ecosystem, including the banks now, leveraging Grab Unlimited, our subscription program, and Grab Rewards to cross-sell. So that scale advantage, along with that consistent investment in product and tech, means that the in-app experience and the reliability and affordability is very hard for social media players to, to replicate. Um, so in our view, the social media players will not impact our long-term margins and growth prospects, and we're maintaining, we're maintaining the, the outlook for those long-term margins. 
So uh, I hope I hope we sound confident. It's not that we're complacent. We are monitoring very very carefully. You know what those interactions are between the social uh, social media players and the other players in the industry. Uh, we think that the uh, the relationship we have with many of them allows us to to optimize acquisition, or provide the best possible combination of reliability and affordability um, once in our app. And then your, ne your next question was about the premium offerings. Thanks for that. Yeah, we're very excited about the premium offerings. Uh, so high value rides, it really creates a win-win situation because the Grab Premium generates about twice, uh, in fact, even more than twice the revenue per ride that the standard rides generate. So that's very beneficial for the driver partners. And it's helping us to attract more limos, more luxury cars and drivers onto our platform. Uh, typically in the past, those, those, uh, those platforms have stayed away from, from all of the on-demand platforms. But I think with this um, advanced booking ride-hailing product, which was just relaunched, um, they see that now as very appropriate for them in terms of ability to attract travelers and uh, to attract executives. And this is helping our supply at the high end. It's enabling us to drive over three times higher driver earnings per ride so uh, those individuals who own their own uh, limos are actually now much more interested in driving with us. Travelers account uh, for about 20% of our premium mobility MTUs regionally, and then the average basket size is about 1.5 times higher in both transport and food for tourists. So we, we maintain our view that this, uh, tra this traveler tourist seg segment is extremely attractive for our services. And we are deliberately targeting them at airports, as you can see from some of our out-of-home advertising. And uh, what you may not see is we're also advertising um, digitally in, those, uh, in the, the outgoing markets like India, North Asia, et cetera, coming into, coming into this region. It's still early days for our premium offerings. I'm glad you asked, asked the question. The, the, the launches are a bit behind the launches that we did for Sava. So the saver, saver is reaching critical mass a bit earlier, but we do expect uh, considerable growth from the premium offerings for the next two quarters as they start to uh, gain scale as well in the region. And then on, on lastly, on TransCab, um, I think probably most of you are aware uh, the CCCS in Singapore decided not to clear our proposed acquisition. Um, we had hoped to use it to accelerate uh, new supply or to create more productivity from the taxi fleet um, that we were acquiring so that it would, in fact, um, essentially add supply to the Singapore market. Um, but in the meantime, we've been actually working on supply enhancement in Singapore in many, many different ways, um, most particularly, obviously, because through our technology where we're getting higher and higher productivity from the drivers in Singapore um, with a lot of, a lot of new initiatives and then we've also been attracting um, new fleets to work with us in Singapore. So the, I think um, I hope consumers will realize that they're still able to book taxis through the Grab app. Um, we continue to be open to working with the other taxi companies. And in fact, we already work with uh, TransCab. So uh, we're basically taking it in our stride and enhancing supply in, in other ways to compensate. So I think we, everything, business as usual, we continue. The Thanks, next Alex. question. Thank you. The next question comes from Sachin Sogankar at Bank of America. Thank you for the opportunity. I have two questions. Uh, first question is on our delivery of beta margin. Uh, we see for last couple of quarters it's hovering in the range of 1.5, 1.6 versus let's say in QQ it was high at 2.1%. I do understand there's a bit of a seasonality associated with that, but apart from that, anything else which is impacting it? And general thoughts on how we should look at the margin. Should we see a near-term improvement uh, in this margin? Uh, any changes to your long-term guidance out here? Um, second question is on your financial services. Uh, clearly now all uh, digibanks have been launched in all three countries. You do expect your second half to be better than first half. So in that context, any change in terms of guidance and break-even in financial services? Uh, let me uh, <coughs> take the questions and both of them here. Look, on deliveries margin, um, we, we're continuing to invest in products at the same time. You've seen some, uh, if you look from a quarter-on-quarter -quarter perspective, we 
our, our margin uh, slightly ticked up. Uh, if you look at from a year-over-year year basis, uh, our margin for, for deliveries uh, improved by about 110 basis points. So overall, I think we're making all the right decisions in investing into new products also in deliveries. We spoke a lot about mobility. We shouldn't forget about deliveries also. Uh, well, um, there's a ton of stuff that's going on in the delivery side. Uh, we've got also dine-out features now uh, prominent in our app. Um, the users are, are using it. Uh, there's other initiatives also that were, that were in the works. Our grocery delivery, our, as well as our uh, mart delivery, continues to, to see good momentum. Um, so we'll make, continue to make those investments. So we'll continue to, uh, continue to make those investments and also balance profitability at the same time. So we'll continue to grow the EBITDA of our deliveries business. It's important that we do that. Um, and we feel pretty good in where we are today. And we'll see, you'll see sequential growth in both... Our GMV revenue and our EBITDA dollars from that perspective. We're committed to the 4% plus in terms of margins. Um, you'll see margins swing from one quarter to a quarter. Uh, some of that, it could be just the product mix in the business and also how advertising comes in also uh, into the business. Uh, but where we are today, the, the, the margin for deliveries, we feel is in a good spot. And we are shooting for that 4% plus. Uh, in, in, from a long-term margin perspective. Um, a second question around the banks itself. Um, you saw all the statistics that uh, in the prepared remarks. What you saw there was this, the, the momentum that we're seeing in both Singapore and Malaysia and also including Indonesia in the deposit base. Um, we're starting to see now momentum in our loans business, uh, both across uh, especially our grab fin as well as in our banks. Um, and in my remarks, I, I, I alluded that we remain committed for our banks to break even uh, by no later than the second half of 2026. And we're seeing some good momentum in where the users are leveraging the banks within our Grab ecosystem. Uh, over 80% of our Grab users are actually uh, are leveraged in terms of the, the deposit holders and those who are using the bank products today uh, it's a, there's a, a good 80% portion of them are Grab users, and that's healthy, and that's what we want to see. Uh, and we're continuing to get more products out also for our banks, uh, and also as we drive uh, the profitability to come uh, for no later than 2026. Thank you. Thanks, Sachin. Next question, operator. The next question comes from Piyush Chaudhary at HSBC. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the call. Uh, two questions, please. Firstly, um, could you talk a little bit about competitive landscape across both the ride hailing and delivery segment? The uh, reason to ask is uh, what has led to increase in incentive spends in on-demand segment? Uh, it rose to you know, around 10.1% of GMV in 2Q versus 97 in first quarter. Uh, and that's the first question. Secondly, um, uh, you have explained on the mobility margin drop, but um, w what is the breakup of how much of the drop is due to new rollout of new product rollouts and how much is due to change in product mix? And how long will these investments into new product initiatives uh, would persist uh, in the mobility segment? Thank you. Thanks, Piyush. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of new launch activity going on in this quarter, uh, not just in mobility, but also deliveries. You know, Peter was referring to the Omni services that we've been launching, um, as well as uh, Saver there. And then we've got Saver and advanced booking in the, in the mobility space. So those incentives were largely associated with supporting those launches. Um, the competitive activity is there, but it's always been there, as I, as I was saying earlier. So we don't see any particular intensification of competitive activity. Um, the product mix uh, is, is a factor. Um, you know, obviously, the saver launches went ahead of the premium launches. So that has changed the product mix in the short term. But like I was saying earlier, we, we are expecting the premium launches to get more traction in the second half because they were launched uh, only very recently. Maybe we're going to add, Piyush, um, 
you know, we don't break up the split up between um, what's new product and, and product mix because there are some seasonal impact in terms of what type of rides people take in the different months uh, also. And also uh, there is also tourism that comes into it. Uh, as, as Alex mentioned earlier, the tourism market also attracts more, much of a high-valued rides for us. So I think overall, well, what we're doing is a balance between new products and product mix and new products as well as incentives, uh, also growing the supply base uh, also at the same time. We are anticipating a strong second half for mobility business. We're ramping up our driver supply base. We're ramping up premium driver supply base also uh, as we anticipate the traveler segment also growing here uh, in Southeast Asia. So from a margin perspective, we'll continue to be committed to the long-term margin of 9% plus for mobility. Um, and we expect also to continue to drive EBITDA growth in our mobility business, especially in the second half versus the first half. Next question is from Ranjan Sharma at JP Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, <clears throat> good evening, and uh, thank you for the presentation and the opportunity. So I just have two questions. Firstly, on your stock-based compensation, I see the first half is running at a higher level compared to the first half of last year, and even the quarter is running much higher than the quarterly run rate that you had from the second to third quarter, second to fourth quarter last year. Now, when your corporate, when your headcount is getting optimized, like why is your stock based compensation uh, running high? If you can share uh, more color uh, uh, around that. And and secondly, uh, and the second question is on your free cash flows. Uh, your your guidance is maintained on EBITDA. Uh, so. But you see an inflection and uh, adjusted uh, free cash flow. So if you can help us understand what, what is the moving part. Thank you. Sure, Ranjan. If you look at our uh, stock-based compensation, if you look at the first half, uh, and I'm going to compare it to the last half of last year, we're roughly about $8 million higher than last year. Um, and there's always timings when it comes to vesting periods. Yes, we do have a lowered headcount. Uh, but if you also remember that the headcount that we made the reduction was in the second half. That was in June last year when we, did, when we did the restructuring. So a lot of the benefits that you'll see, you'll flow in the second half. So I don't think first half is a good comparison. What I'll say is that from a SBC perspective, as a percentage of revenue, um, it'll be lower, roughly about 200 to 300 basis points on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, and it's, it's a cost that we're also obviously watching very closely here. Um, and on dilution, just to give another perspective on SBC, it's currently pacing at roughly about 2%, and we're very judicious when it comes to that. Actually, if you include the share buyback program, our dilution is roughly about 1.3%, and we're planning to actually deploy uh, our share buyback program more judiciously also uh, to manage our overall uh, share dilution. Uh, second question around free cash flow. Um, look, the... the the, really, the difference between our, the, 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 the delta between EBITDA and free cash flow, a lot of the components is really on working capital and, and CAPEX itself. Yeah, so if you look at our CAPEX uh, in, the first, in the first half, it's roughly running about $50 million. Um, and, and then the other part is working, ca working capital. Uh, working capital in the second half is traditionally much more positive than the first half. Um, and also the third component probably is a little bit more uh, different than last year is taxes. So our income tax expense is higher than last year, but that's also natural just given the, the profitability profile of our business and just in certain countries, the way our NOLs are, are also being utilized and also certain entities are just uh, achieving profitability much faster uh, than the other countries from a tax perspective. The next question is from Mark Mahoney at Evercall. Hey, thanks. I'll just ask one question. These uh, group MTUs, I think they rose about 2.4 million sequentially. I think that's the biggest increase uh, you've had uh, in the last uh, two plus years or something like that. So just go through what, um, what were the big uh, inflection point drivers of the growth in uh, group MTUs. Thank you. 
Hi, Mark. Yeah, thanks for the question. The biggest driver was the push for affordability. So we specifically made this decision to use our scale to drive affordability, and that's allowed us to attract new users to the platform. Um, so we're seeing 14% and 15% respectively new users to deliveries and mobility through those saver products first, and then we cross-sell from there. So that's been a big injection of new MTUs. And then this, the transaction volumes are coming uh, and therefore boosting MTUs as well. So we're getting higher frequency from existing users and that's boosting MTUs. So this was an in, intentional strategy. We flagged it at the start of this year and we talked about the new product launches that would underpin it. And we're delighted that we are seeing that MTU increase. In our view, this is a leading indicator for you know, future revenue and, and profitability growth. So we think it's a good investment for us to make for shareholders. Thank you very much. Next question is from Zhong Xiao at Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question. My apologies for getting a bit late. If I ask you, you already answered my apologies. Um, I saw you had a nice improvement in regional cost this quarter. Um, could you talk about sort of your outlook for the next two quarters as well? There was a nice reduction quarter over quarter in Q2. Um, that's on the on the regional cost. I know already you, you uh, have talked about the sort of the competition or potential competition from TikTok, but I want to flip to the other side because obviously um, some of your peers only really have the uh, business food delivery in one country in a way. Do you think um, the the potential revenue opportunities or partner opportunities with, with TikTok in the other countries in the region where you you have a very high market share. Thank you. Hey, John, let me take the first one on uh, regional copper costs, and I'll turn it to Alex on competition. Um, so on regional copper costs, as you know, and I've been speaking this now for many quarters, we've been very focused in driving our cost structure down. Um, and it's, uh, we, we, as we scale this business, we want to drive more operating leverage. Our, our regional copper cost was down 14% on a year-over-year -year basis for the second quarter. And in terms of how we're thinking for the rest of the half here, um, what I did say earlier was our regional copper cost for the year 2024 will be lower than 2023. Uh, and that gives you a bit of perspective how to model that for the rest of this year. Now, uh, we see we're going to continue to find ways in optimizing our cost uh, structure, whether it's fixed or variable. Because again, uh, as we drive scale, we want to drive more operating leverage in the business. Um, and the, let me ask, uh, answer the second question about um, you know, the potential upside from the growth of social media in the region. It, it is true, actually, yeah. I think that the online commerce is growing as a category. And uh, we work with all of the social media platforms as marketing partners to, to attract top of funnel. The, the most direct impact that we would see outside of food delivery is our Grab Express services. And Grab Express, which is the last mile delivery service, is growing. It's, uh, one of, it's the largest instant delivery service in the region. And we do see upside there as, uh, as our merchant partners uh, work with, with social media platforms and as we ourselves use it to attract users into the, into the platform. Thanks for the question. Could I please follow up uh, on both questions? One is that, Peter, do you have a comments about, um, uh, I, I know in the past it may have talked about corporate costs to be kind of flattish next year, a any update there? And back to the social media, I also want to follow up that, uh, just curious if you already start discussion about trials uh, in terms of the working with, uh, with them. I know they have started trials in Indonesia with another company, uh, as you probably know. Thank you. Uh, we're not uh, providing guidance yet for next year. Uh, we'll do that in due time. Uh, we'll continue to, to optimize our costs. And that's my commitment to the business. It's always been. And we'll find ways to do that. So um, what, what you'll see is, and you can see the trend of our corporate cost structure of our business. Uh, we'll continue to find ways to it. Um, and again, it, this is not just fixed costs, right? You also got variable costs uh, into, those, into those components. So. Uh, again, we're, when we look for every opportunity where we can. And, and John, yeah, I won't comment on any specific discussions, as I'm sure you'll understand. 
Um, but the, the way we work with the social media platforms is we use them for demand generation. You know, and, the, and there are me, there are several very uh, large and successful platforms for us to, to choose from. So we work with all of them and we optimize our marketing efforts across them to make sure that we manage our acquisition costs accordingly. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Last. Thanks very much, guys, for uh, listening to the call. I hope it was helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, please address it to our investor relations team. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, have more conversations with all of you. So thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. And talk next quarter. This concludes Grab's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now discount.